DiscerningHearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Dr. Lillis is an associate professor and the academic dean of St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, as well as the academic advisor for the St. Juan Diego House of Priestly Formation for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from his lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He is the author of Hidden Mountain Secret Garden, a Theological Contemplation of Prayer, as well as numerous other books focused on the spiritual life. In this series of Conversations with Dr. Lillis, we focus on Doctor of the Church, St. Teresa of Avila, and her great spiritual masterwork, The Interior Castle. Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We continue our conversation from our previous episode discussing the fourth mansion, Chapter 3, of St. Teresa of Avila's Interior Castle. Would you say, Anthony, the process is we enter into this disposition of being open in prayer to wanting and desiring to love Jesus more, to love God, to reach out in that, that it's a process, it, it, we hear it so often, it's to listen. And that from what I've heard you say and in, in from this particular chapter in this section, that it's as we begin to do that, we may, in listening, the, the Lord may be bringing forward some things he sees in us. Don't try to push things away necessarily as much as, all right, this is here, I give this to you, Lord. And it, it may be memories that we long for, had forgotten, or it may be sentiments or even sins that we weren't even truly aware that we had embraced. And that process can take a long time in this deep listening and this conversation of love. It may take years. And it sounds as though it didn't for a while with Teresa. And it still continues in my life. But is that a, a fair way of looking at this type of recollection that she's speaking of? Yeah. You know, when you try to produce it yourself, there you get into a lot of, you actually delay. <laughs> God mm -hmm. wants to give you this gift. And so you try to grasp it and you, you delay his own work in you. Uh, whereas if you're surrendered and open to what he wants to do, you have given him the freedom finally to give you the gift. Part of the reason why this conversation takes so long is it's hard for us to let go of control and to be completely surrendered to the Lord. It's just that something in us rebels against it. Adam and Eve, since that time, we've, we've had a hard time with trust of the, with the Lord. And, and so in this kind of prayer that the Lord wants to give us, in order to give it to us, he will take some time disposing us to be able to receive the gift. She gives a number of reasons why we shouldn't try to seize this gift of absorption. One that we've already seen is that this gift of absorption, the shepherd's voice when it calls out to us, is a very peaceful, beautiful movement. And our own efforts are to silence our mind, our, our efforts to silence our imagination and close down our powers. There's something violent or painful in that. And it acts directly against the gift. The other thing that can happen too is like when you're trying to silence your mind, you're trying not to think anymore and just, I'm not going to think anymore. And the more you tell yourself, I'm not going to think, that the, the more... <laughs> the more you're thinking, you yeah. know. And she even and, says that. I mean, she even brings that forward. She says, it doesn't work for her. It, all she yeah. does is make her think more. So yeah, it awakens more thoughts. And your thoughts aren't of the Lord. Your thoughts are of the fact that you're thinking, you know. And and we've got to find a way to... Uh, the, it, that's why this whole effort is, is futile. Another reason is that she says... The most important and pleasing thing in God's eyes is our remembering his honor and glory and forgetting ourselves and our own profits and ease and pleasure. And how can a person be forgetful of himself when he's taking such great care about his actions that he dare not even stir or allow his understanding or desires to stir? 
even for the purpose of desiring the greater glory of God or of rejoicing in the glory which is his. When his majesty wishes the working of the understanding to cease, he employs it in another manner and illumines the soul's knowledge to so much higher a degree than any we can ourselves attain that he leads it into the state of absorption in which, without knowing how, it is much better instructed than it ever could be as a result of its own efforts. This idea of allowing the Lord to lead us without our knowing how, it's an idea that John of the Cross will also pick up on in his great spiritual classic called The Ascent of Mount Carmel. It's a commentary on his poem, uh, The Dark Night. And that poem, The Dark Night, is all about how the Lord kind of puts our soul at rest or into sleep so that without our knowing how, that's in the dark night, without our being able to see, he draws us into deep intimacy with him. That teaching of St. John of the Cross is something that completely connects with what Teresa of Avila is trying to say here. The Lord wants to lead us out but as long as we're aware of our own actions and we're trying to attain results uh, on our own terms, uh, we're actually spoiling the work. Uh, we're too self-aware. If only we would be more aware of the Lord's honor and glory and how magnificent he is. If only we would rejoice in the goodness of who he is. All of a sudden, the ability for him to lead us into this beautiful movement of prayer we would be giving him the freedom to do so. But the more occupied we are with the results we want instead of his glory, the more we put handcuffs on God and prevent him from being able to give us the gifts he wants to give us. Again, it's such a struggle sometimes, Anthony, because even in the Catholic Church today, there are, I don't know how else to say it, uh, different schools of thought that you need to empty everything in your mind, and you just sit there, pull a number or use a word, and then anything that comes forward, push it aside. Mm. And I've experienced that. There are some who may say, well, that was very helpful for me, and that was very edifying, and we do that practice. I've read The Interior Castle. She seemed to say that goes against. We're pushing things away. And Maybe I'm not describing that well, but what's your insight on that? Yeah, no, I think that kind of goes with exactly what Teresa is trying to say to us in this text. One of the names for the kind of prayer that you just described, where you repeat a word over and over and then push everything out to the side, that's called centering prayer. Mm -hmm. And before that, you know, transcendental meditation kind of advocated basically the same kind of technique. And the idea is then, uh, and people experience something, they experience some kind of psychic state. So I'm not going to say that the, there's no experience there at all. The, the question is, is that psychic state ultimately salvific? Does it lead you into the kingdom of heaven? Does it lead you into Jesus? Does it lead you into the honor and glory of the Father? Teresa of Avila has questions about that. That's what she's raised in this. She, she's not so sure that kind of technique actually helps. She thinks it's too self-occupied, actually. All the effort to force yourself to be quiet through this prayer word is, is actually incredible self-occupation. So, so then the question comes, if I can be so self-deceived and so caught up in self-occupation so easy, how do I avoid that? How do I get around that? And this is where that little passage I read about turning our hearts to the mm -hmm. honor and glory of God is key in subordinating all the desired results we want to that. And just say, Lord, you know, you will produce the results when you want. What I want is your honor and glory. When we do this, there are fruits that happen in a soul that I do not think the spiritual writers who've advocated centering prayer or, or even, uh, even now it's Catholic mindfulness, but before that it was a transcendental meditation. The spiritual writers don't promise the kinds of things that Teresa of Avila say result from the kind of prayer that she's describing. This prayer of absorption does some things that those other kinds of techniques can't do. And the reason why is because those other kinds of prayer 
whether they lead you into the salvation that Jesus promised us, our reconciliation to the Father, transformation in the Holy Spirit, whether they actually lead there, in her mind is a great question. She knows from her own experience of this prayer, the way she pursued it in her own life, that when we are surrendered to God and allow him to call us in his time, when we're disposed to the voice of the shepherd by leaving worldly things and worldly cares and reordering our life towards God, when we do this and we hear the voice of the shepherd, it produces fruits she's convinced of, and that's what she wants. She wants us to have the fruits that she's convinced of. I've heard you say it repeatedly in retreats, Anthony, when the things come forward in your mind, Give that to the Lord and gently bring yourself back, using the word to bring you back into worship of him and in contemplation of him. Would that be a, a proper summation of that? Yes, because what we're trying to do in prayer is a very simple, loving movement towards the Lord. And it's very gentle and it's very delicate because the way he's, and the reason why our movement to the Lord needs to be gentle and delicate is because that's how the Lord is working in our hearts. Uh, yes, we're we're not so gentle when it comes to rooting out sin. We're steeped in sin. It's going to be hard and painful, and we got to do that. But at this stage of the game, it's not so much you're having to renounce mortal sin from your life anymore and change from one way of life to a totally different way of life. You're you're turned to the Lord. You've chosen to enter the castle. If outside you can march around in the mud and run to the castle, once you get inside, you, you need to clean off your shoes. You don't run around in the house. You walk with dignity through the house, with the kind of stateliness that is becoming a son and daughter of God. It's a simple, loving movement of our powers to the Lord. And as the shepherd's voice calls to them, they will enter into that. We make ourselves present to the Lord, and he will call our powers and the powers will come in the castle with us. Teresa says something very powerful about what happens when we do this, and that is actually when we let Jesus call our powers, this kind of recollection enlarges the inside of our soul. It makes our capacity for love even greater. This is the thing. I don't see that happening with Centering Prayer or TM or even Catholic mindfulness, I'm not convinced that it happens there uh, because I think there's too much self-occupation in it. Uh, but when you let the shepherd's voice call the powers of your soul, I agree with Teresa of Avila. I've seen this myself in the lives of different people. Their capacity to love, to give themselves, to not be self-occupied, all of a sudden it explodes. And this is what Teresa wants for souls. We'll return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis in just a moment. Did you know that you can obtain a free app which contains all your favorite Discerning Hearts programs? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Archbishop George Lucas, Father Mauritius Fildi, and so many more, including episodes from Inside the Pages can be obtained on the Discerning Hearts free app. This also includes all the novenas and devotionals and prayers, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, the Chaplet of St. Michael, and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady, all available on the Discerning Hearts free app. Visit the iTunes and Google Play app stores to obtain your free Discerning Hearts app today. A Prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. 
We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, or Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. The one thing that we are called to do, if I'm reading Teresa right in this, the action is to avoid sin. Ultimately, you will see the effects of this, this just this gentle, loving engagement and desire to praise, worship, love him, listen to him in prayer. It will be manifested in this desire to stay away from sin. And she uses that analogy of the baby nursing at the mother's breast. I mean, that is very powerful, isn't it? Mm. This would be, you know, part of the fruit of this kind of prayer. You, you engage in it. You're strengthened again in your struggle against sin. It's not something that has the same claim over your life, and you have much better ability to avoid it. I was speaking to someone more recently who fell and fell really, really hard, and they're trying to climb back into the life of prayer again and. We talked for a long time about the importance of exactly this kind of prayer where you simply present yourself to the Lord, how he communicates everything you need to win the struggle. The thing that the soul said to me, this good person said to me was, you know, Anthony, it's not really true that the Lord only gives you what you can handle. He, I, he goes, I feel like I've been pushed far beyond anything I can handle. It is true. The Lord pushes us to the very periphery of our being so that we learn to rely not on our own industry, but on him alone. When the Lord says that he, when it's said that the Lord never gives us more to handle, he doesn't mean that more than we can handle on our own. He means more than we can handle with him. But if we try to go to uh, engage the struggle of sin without the Lord, we're going to fall every single time. Um, and we will always find ourselves pushed beyond what we can endure. But if we will turn our hearts to the Lord and give him the thoughts and desires and dreams of our hearts and surrender them to him without a pure love, the Lord is going to do something magnificent inside us. And part of the magnificent thing is freedom from sin, strength to endure temptation. So that's part of this too. This holy recollection it frees us from sin. It gives us strength against temptation. In addition to the strength and freedom, this holy absorption in the Lord enlarges our ability to love. We find ourselves not only free from sin, strong against temptation, but our capacity to love grows within us. We want to do heroic things. We're no longer afraid of doing penance. Why don't we do penance? Why don't we go to confession more? Why don't we pray a little bit more and fast a little bit more? Because, you know, in the back of my mind, our minds, we think, oh, this isn't so good for my health. It might impact my life in a negative way. And so I better not push myself too hard. That, that's the self lie. That's self occupation. <laughs> Obviously, we want to submit things to our spiritual director. But what's really going on is lethargy. Our hearts are too small. God isn't the strong enough priority of our lives. And because he's not the strong enough priority of our lives, because our hearts are way too small, you know, uh, the the littlest inconvenient thing we think is a terrible heroic sacrifice. The Lord can't possibly ask me. But when the shepherd calls our powers inside, when he quiets our souls, when he enlarges them, all of a sudden there is nothing that he asks that is too much. It's all too little. We can't do enough for him because we realize how much we are loved. The immensity of his love 
that he reveals in this kind of prayer when we allow him to call our, our, our powers, when we um, uh, are vulnerable to his voice, the immensity of love of the Father that is unveiled before us, that resounds in us, makes our hearts grow, expand, be so enlarged with love that we want to do anything we possibly can for him. Penance no longer scares us. The sacrifices no longer intimidate us. There is nothing that we do not want to do for God. A new courage is breathed within us. And that's why this prayer is so important. You know, she ends the chapter in the last several paragraphs with an interesting concern, something to watch out for. She mentions trances, that we might be deceived in thinking that we give too much and that can be ill for our health and it can be a deception. It is possible to induce a kind of trance which is not salvific encounter with the Lord. Uh, it's possible to do that even within a church or oratory. So it looks like prayer from the outside and you think you've achieved something because you've gotten to this state of consciousness. So how do you know w whether the state that you've entered into is actually from God or not? This is where spiritual direction is great import. If there's no fruits, it's probably not from God. This kind of prayer is meant to be fruitful in our lives. It doesn't put us into the psychic state uh, where we're kind of above and beyond and removed from everybody. That actually could be a demonic deception, and, and Teresa talks about that. I have to admit, uh, she does crack me up a bit. I'm going to be just, <laughs> when she says, they fancy this a trance and call it one, but I call it nonsense. <laughs> so, yes. It does nothing, just as you said, but waste their time and injure their health. I just, she's so practical <laughs> and earthy that it, it is not that the, the, the person, it, I mean, they're not, maybe you would like to believe that it's a, they're trying to be biased, that there's an, a, an intention of heart, but as you said, they can be deceived. Yeah, and what's important, at this stage of the game, you're dealing with not a beginner in the spiritual life. You're dealing with somebody who kind of begun to have a lot of really great practices, and so in the back of your mind, you think you're beginning to accomplish things, and, uh, and that it's all smooth sailing from here. You know... This is exactly when we're most vulnerable to demonic uh, deception. The evil one is going to work to try to give you something that appears to be very, very good, but is not the work of God in you. And this kind of trance-induced uh, kind of recollection is a cheap substitute for the grace that Teresa of Avila is, wants us to know. She's trying to clarify that we're talking about peace we're talking about a new gentleness. We're talking about our powers entering within the castle more deeply, being drawn closer to Christ. But she wants to distinguish this from like a artificial piece. She says, it must be understood that although when the state is something that really comes from God, there may be languor, both interior and exterior. There will be none in the soul which, when it finds itself near the Lord, is moved with great joy. This is a curious paradox. On one hand, she says, when this prayer begins, there may be an experience of languor, some kind of suffering, and the suffering can be exterior. It might come in the form of physical illness. It's a curious thing. Those who begin to be drawn into prayer, like Teresa of Avila herself, it's not that their physical ailments go away. Sometimes they seem to get more. The number of contemplatives I know who deal with serious physical difficulties or their lives falling apart all around them, and people they love leaving the church and everything going wrong, that is very hard, a painful suffering for them. That's an exterior languor they're suffering. And then in addition to that, there can be interior things to, that happen, like terrible anxieties that it weigh upon the soul, and dread and fear, and all kinds of things that kind of paralyze us or 
uh, sometimes the the worst uh, fantasies, impure fantasies, kind of the soul suffers from those things. And yet those things that I just, those interior trials aren't the deepest core of what's going on. So this is where the paradox, all those trials are going on. And yet the soul on a deeper level has a fundamental happiness. And for those who use other techniques and things, one of the things you, one of the things to discern is whether this technique is helping me or not is, do I have the joy of the Lord? Because a soul that is drawn into this prayer by the voice of the shepherd does have this joy. Everything can be going wrong on the outside in the exterior. And many, many things can be going wrong on the interior, on the inside. You can be a, on a certain level, almost a psychological wreck, but, but you still have the joy of the Lord. Just to kind of bring this home, uh, Louis Martin, the father of Therese of Lisieux, they wanted to canonize Louis and say they Martin because they wanted to hold up before the faithful a married couple that was saintly. But there was a problem with Louis. The problem was that he, at the end of his life, he struggled with severe mental illness. He would be seized with kind of fear and anger and use foul language sometimes and violent movements. And they thought, how can you say that such a man is a saint if he suffered a mental illness that would cause him to, pay, to act so irrationally? And so that was the big debate in Rome in the early 1990s about Louis Martin. Can somebody who's mentally ill be a saint? Can somebody who is experiencing interior languor, psychological suffering, actually be a saint? And the answer ultimately, as we know, with the canonization of Louis and Zede, yes, you can suffer these things and still have the joy of the Lord still be fruitful in the Lord, that the joy of the Lord is not limited even by psychological illness. And I wanted to bring that up today because I've met contemplatives and other people of deep prayer who sometimes struggle with different kinds of mental illness. And it's a terrible, terrible cross. And yet, as I speak to them, I also see they know the joy of the Lord. The powers of their soul, though they're, they're not well and not permitted to, to experience terrible suffering, those powers have drawn close to the Lord, and the Lord has expanded their hearts, has enlarged their hearts, and they want to do heroic and beautiful things for the Lord, even though their whole psychology and their life is falling apart around them. God can still work in them and still gives them this kind of prayer. Yeah, I, I'm thinking of even those who are suffering now with things such as Alzheimer's, and you can begin to see the memory is fading. You can see it in their life, can't you, Anthony? There are some things that they still hold on to so tightly. It's so deep. It's so penetrating that it just, it's all about grace, isn't it? I mean, it's the great mystery of grace. You can extend this to, to other things, too. That, uh, uh, But uh, Alzheimer's, you know, um, uh, sometimes you have a loved one and all of a sudden they're acting uh, irascible and angry in a way they didn't act before. And it disturbs your heart that you see what you see. Does this mean that they aren't close to God, that their life of being faithful to the Lord and a good witness is all thrown away because they're subject to this disease. And all we see is on the outside. All we see is the physical manifestations of a disease. But interiorly, what God is doing there, that is something magnificent, and it might be all hidden from us. Our obligation becomes to support this soul, even though the soul doesn't understand what's going on, doesn't understand its own suffering. Support this soul in every way we can to discover and to remember, and even if they can't discover or remember, on a deeper level to possess the joy of the Lord that their psychological powers because of a disease like Alzheimer's isn't allowing them to know. We could extend this to other things like uh, young people and older people who 
uh, have autism, for example, mm -hmm. or other people who are in a vegetative state even. Uh, we do not know the beautiful work of prayer that God is working in somebody's heart. And our job is to love them and support them as they make this offering to the Lord, painful as it looks on the outside. And the joy of the Lord, even though we can't see it, as he's communicating himself to them, that joy will be reflected in our own hearts too. That's beautiful counsel, Anthony. She closes this chapter with that paragraph 13. She will talk about the importance of being aware of what's going on in our minds and our imaginations. And sometimes they get so fancy that whatever they think about, they begin to believe, and it can be very dangerous and very discerning territory. If we haven't been before, we really are now. But she said, I'm going to deal with that in the later mansions. So she leaves us in this fourth mansion, and you as well. What are your final thoughts? Well, just I mentioned that the opportunity for demonic deception at this stage of the game, rather great, because the evil one doesn't want you to get beyond this stage. And so he's going to do everything he can to distract you with counterfeit spiritual experiences. This is where spiritual direction and talking to a good spiritual friend about what's going on interiorly is important. And it's also prior to this, she's talked about the need for humility. Well, all that groundwork for humility comes in here. Just because we've begun to experience something beautiful from God doesn't mean that we've arrived. It doesn't mean that our journey's over. The battle continues, and we have a long ways to go. But with God's help, we'll get there. We just need his wisdom. We need holy friendships. We need the body of Christ around us so that we learn to rely on the Lord and not what we think we're experiencing, but on what he's actually doing in us. Again, wise counsel. Thank you so much, Anthony. It's been a grace. We'll talk to you soon. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. There, too, you will find an audio version of The Interior Castle by St. Teresa of Avila, the masterwork in which this series has been based. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis.